I don't know if you've noticed, but I have a lot of books. And generally, I don't think that's a problem. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a lot of books or buying a lot of books or doing book hauls or even just having a lot of books aspirationally that you're not going to read. But for me, for my personal preference, I feel like I have too many books and I feel like a lot of them I'm not sure I'm ever going to read. And for me, that's an issue. And then on top of that, I just haven't been reading enough lately. I honestly can't remember the last time I sat down to actually read a book. And as you know from some of my past videos, this is a reoccurring issue and I'm an author and I want to read. I want to soak up other authors' work. Luckily, I think I might have come up with a solution for both. I am going to challenge myself to read one chapter of a book a day, but not from the same book. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the books I own and I'm going to read the first chapter and I'm going to divide them into categories based on my experience reading that first chapter. I figured that reading the first chapter is a really good way to figure out the writing style, the tone, whether or not I'm interested in continuing reading, and from there I can separate the books into want to continue reading and don't want to continue reading. And then from the don't continue to read pile I can sort of divide it into, well, I don't want to keep reading this book, but it looks really pretty and I want to have it displayed on my shelves, but hopefully I'm going to limit that to like one shelf maybe two. Come on, look at this Grimm's Fairy Tales. It's gorgeous. I can't get rid of this. And then hopefully books that I really want to read, like Ancillary Justice, which one of my really good friends recommended, I'll read the first chapter and then think, oh my goodness, I can't wait to go back, but I have to read the first chapter of every other book I own first, but then I can read this. On that note, I have Ancillary Justice out anyway. I wanted to read it on probably my winter break, but I didn't. So I'm gonna get started over there. Come with me. Something I hadn't considered is that if I'm only reading the first chapter and then I'm stopping and I know I'm gonna need to read the first chapter later, I don't even need to go find a bookmark right now. I count that as a win. Editing Shayna here. It turns out that for some of the books I didn't explain what they were about, especially if I liked them, but I want you to know that in case you want to read them yourself. So I'm just gonna put in some VO of my thoughts here. Okay, Ancillary Justice is about an AI that used to be a ship AI, but is currently inhabiting a body. In the first chapter, they come across one of their former crew members and decide to help them, even though they have other business to attend to. It's definitely a sci-fi book, but one of those sci-fi books that feels kind of fantasy-ish, so I'm excited to see where that goes. Two small details that I still remember, the AI refers to everyone with feminine pronouns, even when they go out of their way to point out that their crew member is actually male, which I find to be an interesting distinction of AI and actual humans like a human or humanoid alien narrator would care about getting that right, but a computer is like, what's the difference? Also, the way that healing works seems to be buying healing packs, but then it's full of like mud that has to be caked on an injury, something like that. Mm, we're already done with the first chapter. That makes sense. I do want to keep reading it already. I guess that's a good sign. Should I read another book? I mean, I normally read like three chapters if I'm sitting down to do, yeah, I'm gonna read another book. That's what I'm gonna do. Okay, okay. If you remember my vlog where I was driving across the US and reading books, I read a book called Sourdough that made me cry. And in that book, the author description included their first book, the 24 hour something or other. Uh, Robin Sloan is the author. And when we were at the same bookstore, I believe where we got Sourdough, my husband pointed out, this book, Mr. Penumbra's 24 hour bookstore. It's supposed to be really, really good. So I'm gonna read it and hopefully add it to my, I guess my TBR pile, my to keep to read pile. It's another short chapter. I was worried because the table of contents just uh, lists the sections, but we're good. It's okay. Mr. Penumbra's 24 hour bookstore is about a recently unemployed, I want to say designer. It's been a bit since I read it, but I don't think he was a software engineer, although he did work in tech in San Francisco. It doesn't matter. The main character is unemployed and he's looking for work all the time. He comes across a 24-hour bookstore with a help wanted sign and is intrigued, so he goes inside and ends up being offered a job. It's extremely entertainingly well written and it has such a similar vibe to Sourdough, which I loved so much. I'm noticing a problem with my plan, which is that first chapters are kind of designed to make you want to keep reading. Well, good, because that means I'm going to be really excited to read this later, right? So it's fine. It's good. Okay.
Next book. I think I bought this one at Goodwill. It's called The Animals at Lockwood Manor. I think it's a mystery. Yeah, it sounds kind of mystery, thrillery. Seems cool. So first chapter, here we go. Oh, what do I do with prologues? How long's the prologue? How long's the first chapter? Uh, I'm going to read the prologue and first chapter of this book. The Animals at Lockwood Manor is about a young woman who's working at a museum during World War II. The prologue starts with some vibe setting of Lockwood Manor itself, then the first chapter goes to the museum and how the main character Hetty made a big mistake that she believed would end her career, but because of the war and men getting drafted, now has a chance to prove herself by taking care of the museum's collection of taxidermy animals as they are evacuated to Lockwood Manor. It's the second book I've read in the last year that dealt with someone whose passion is researching taxidermied animals, but in this book I just don't get the sense that the narrator actually cares about this collection very much. It seems like she's more concerned with her career, which made her less sympathetic to me. I think we have our first... It feels mean to only read the first chapter and then say no. But I read the prologue and the first chapter, and it's like while the topic interests me, the writing style really isn't. So yeah, I, I, uh, I think this is gonna go in the resell category. I'll have to find a better place for the piles. Yeah, if anything, I think the fact that I don't want to go grab another book to read the first chapter of, that's telling of this book, that it really just wasn't interesting to me. So that's all for now. See you tomorrow. So it is day two and it's time to read another first chapter. So far, I've just been grabbing books off of a stack that I put together to read over the holidays. And the next one in the stack was The Starlit Wood, a book of short stories by various authors. And I think this is a good time to talk about books that I'm not going to be including in this little experiment. The first group of books that I'm not going to be including are what I'm going to call resource books, for lack of a better phrase. This is things like recipe books, cookbooks, some travel guides that I've been gifted. And also I used to be an actor, so I have a whole collection of plays that I love to read. They don't really have chapters. They don't really fit in. And also they don't take up that much space, so I'm not that worried. Also amongst resources, I'm going to include The Starlit Wood because I bought this book specifically to be a book that I read to learn about writing short stories for publication and to annotate and stuff like that. So I know I'm going to read this, I'm going to study this, so I'm not going to include it. So similarly, I'm not going to be reading the first chapter of books that I have read before. In this case, books one and two of the Circle of Magic series. I read it and have done a video on it actually, so go check that out if you're interested in my thoughts. I'm not sure why this is in the same stack as the other books that I want to read. Okay, so it looks like the next thing I'm reading is The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune. I have heard great things about this author. I actually bought a signed copy of Under the Whispering Door. It's on my bookshelf over here. So I will be reading that first chapter at some point, but first let's, let's read this one, yeah? The first chapter of The House in the Cerulean Sea does double duty world building and character development. The main character is a case manager for incidents where magical children use their powers for less than ideal reasons, like taking revenge on a bully. It's clear, even this early in the first chapter, that the narrator does care about the children he looks into and that the system is not perfect. Given how people love TJ Klune's work, I'm really excited to see how this hypothetical world will grow and I'll get to learn more about it in the rest of the book. Yeah, definitely going to be reading this. Another one on the pile. Now I'm gonna grab another book. Okay, so next in the stack that I have uh, up here, next to my Artemis statue. Another book of short stories that I bought from like an independent author at like, an, like a craft fair, I guess. It doesn't feel fair to judge a whole book off of the first short story. So I think I'm gonna put that in the do not read the first chapter file and deal with this separately. Next up is this book. Uh, it is a biography of Alice Waters and the creation of Shea Panisse in Berkeley, which is where I went to school. So I think it's really cool. As you can see, I'm like halfway through. I have already been reading it. It's just that like six months ago, I stopped and didn't start again, but this is definitely going in the to be read category because I need to finish it. I want to figure out the rest of the story. It's been very interesting so far. So next up is Free Range Chickens. I believe I saw this at a secondhand bookstore and thought it was really interesting. So I'm gonna read the back and then I'll read the first chapter and see what I think. Hmm. I have no idea what made me wanna grab this. Okay, it's like little articles almost. Okay, I'll just read a couple and then decide. Okay, I think I might have had this book when I was a kid is what I'm starting to think that I actually brought this home from my parents' place. Yeah, I uh, this is no longer something I find funny despite 
all of the dog ears. <laughs> Okay, I'm not sure how I got this book. It says it's a complimentary copy. I don't remember. It says it's funny. <laughs> so yeah, it's called Hounded. I'm gonna read it and see what I think. Or, you know, I'm gonna read the first chapter and see what I think. That's the whole point, right? Okay, this already feels fun. Uh, it's about a druid hiding out in like human society. Fairies are trying to get him. It feels very Celtic mythology in modern world. The tone kind of reminds me of... I can't remember the name of that book series. Okay, I'll, I'll put the title here. It reminds me of this book series that I can't remember the title of right now and I don't have anymore because I've sold it already. But yeah, that's another one for the to read pile. I think this is the one that I bought. Okay, yeah. I went to a bookstore and asked if they had anything sort of zombie related because I have a really fun idea for a zombie novel and I wanted to do some market research basically. So this is called Last Ones Left Alive. It was recommended I think because I said something not too gruesome but still zombie. So let's start it. <laughs> That's a very short first chapter. Okay, I, I don't like reading present tense. That's just a personal preference of mine. And this seems to be written in, in present tense. I I feel bad, but I, it seems well written. But I think between it being a zombie novel and it being written in first person present tense, I think it's a no for me. Sorry. Okay, I have another couple of books that are in the I'm not going to read it category because these are sequels to Ancillary Justice, which I have over there in the to be read stack. So by default, these are going to be read, hopefully, or at least the decision. I'm not going to, I don't trust first chapters of sequels not to spoil stuff from the first book. And as an author, I don't think the books, the authors need to worry about that. I think that's totally fine. If you read the sequel first, they need to catch you up. But that means I'm not going to read these. So yeah, last up is the other book that I bought in my zombie market research quest. This one's called Manhunt. Those are cherries in a bag. <laughs> I have a very bad feeling that it's going to stress me out too. And then I'm just not ever going to read it. So I'm going to read the back and I'll read the front and then we'll see what happens. <laughs> Okay. This is really fascinating. Okay, so it's about a zombie plague that attacks only men. And it's about the main characters are trans women who are like taking medication so that they don't become zombies. Wow. And it seems like the like human bad guys that you always have to have in zombie novels are turfs. Ah, it's obviously a little bit graphic already. I, I'm sure my expressions were all over the place, but I think I have to read the rest of this. Ugh, it just seems like such a cool concept and I want to see where it goes. Okay, yeah, it'll go in the to be read pile and I'll have to deal with it someday. Okay, what should I... Oh, Gwen of Your Deception. I started reading this once and I just didn't hold my attention, but I think I was trying to read it before bed, which is notoriously a difficult time for something to keep my attention. Oh, I thought this was signed. Oh, well, it's not. I love adaptations of mythology, including Arthurian legend. So since this is the Guinevere Deception, it's going to be an Arthurian legend retelling, I think. So let's see what it does for me. The Guinevere Deception starts out with the soon-to-be Queen Guinevere being escorted to Camelot to marry Arthur. It's clear she doesn't quite fit in with everyone else and that they are very afraid of the forest and the growth within it, while Guinevere isn't. Something that perplexed me is that Mordred, normally absent until later in Arthurian legend, is one of the people traveling with Guinevere. Also, the castle is carved from a mountain, which is super cool and also something that I wrote back in the day, so it was cool to see it described in a book. Oh uh, yeah, so far I like it. I'm I'm actually kind of relieved. When I did try to read it that one time, I didn't like it, but I do think I was just tired and not in the right mind space, and I'm glad that I gave it a second shot. So going into the to be read pile, and I think that's all I'm going to do today.
yeah i'll see you tomorrow good morning our internet is out the internet company is coming to fix it but it's not ready yet so i thought i would grab a stack of books and that i could read the first chapter in all of them like i've been doing i'm tired okay I just grabbed the next books on the shelf that the Guinevere Deception was on. And so I'm gonna start with The Rook. I'm pretty sure I bought this one at my local used bookstore. Murder mystery, amnesiatic murder mystery is what it looks like from the back cover. So gonna get started. I gotta say, I've literally only read the first section already. I'm like, ooh, this is well written. This is fun. This is interesting. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> so I just checked if it was written by a man. I think it was Daniel O'Malley because whenever I write from a woman's point of view I just I never comment on the breasts I don't think what size are my breasts so so as soon as I see a woman describing herself and she mentions her breasts I'm like was this written by a man yeah <laughs> also you know, it's like a very common fan fiction trope for like a character to look in a mirror and like describe themselves to the audience because it's first person, there's no other way. Like very famously, My Immortal does it. Uh, this book does it, but it makes sense because it's the first time the main character is seeing themselves because they have amnesia, they don't remember anything. So I find that funny and good up until the small breasts comment. Anyway, so you know when characters have like psychic dreams? and it makes no sense. This looks like it was one of those. Um, no, it just turns out literally a character can enter her dreams. And we're introducing this in the first chapter, which I think is very smart. So good, okay, moving on. I just had that moment of like, cool, time to read the next page. Ah, it's chapter two. So I guess this goes in the keep pile because I'm super curious as to what's going on. So, okay, next. This is a book that I grabbed from my childhood home when my parents were moving. It is called Tangerine. I remember it pretty clearly. It's called Tangerine, which is the name of the town. It is about a boy named Paul, who I believe is like a freshman in high school. He has an older brother. They have a very toxic relationship. You know, it's a very, I think middle grade book, if I'm being honest, um, but I'm excited to reread it and I might as well read the first chapter to see if it's as good as I remember. It seems like there was kind of like a prologue. It wasn't very long, I'm gonna keep reading. It doesn't seem like there are straight up chapters. There's like dates and times. I thought I saw a time later, I could be wrong. Um, so I'm just gonna read until the next date change and then I'll call that done and make my decision. Okay, this is one of those really weird situations where like this book made a big impact on me as a kid. So like I vaguely remember what happens and part of why I want to read it, I know is just because I know the ending and I want to see, or like I know the twist at the end and I want to see what the outcome of that is because it matters to me. And I guess I am intrigued, I don't know, it's, it's hard. It's a different writing style, it's obviously a younger book. I am going to put it in the to be read pile. I could probably finish this all right now if I wanted to, but that's not what I'm doing. That's not the experiment that I'm doing. So next book. Okay, we got another young one, Ella Enchanted. I love the movie. I feel like I read this book once. I'm not sure. I'm gonna read the first chapter and see what I feel like. <sighs> it's like I said on the first day, first chapters, they're meant to grab you. They're meant to hook you. I. Mm. I don't remember that first chapter kind of being like that. So it's very interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna read this, but later, not now. Okay, this one, this one I got from a used bookstore in LA. Literally, it was like I was talking to someone there and she pointed it out and said that she really liked it. So I grabbed it and I bought it because I didn't want to embarrass myself. So I, I kind of actually don't know what this is about. I'm going to read the uh, whatever this is called. I, I hope it's the summary and then I'll read the first chapter and we'll see if it ends up in another used bookstore someday. Mm. So it's a book about the Holocaust. Um, might be kind of stressful. Let's read the first chapter and see what we think. Okay, it's one of those weirdly organized books. Okay, okay. So it seems like there are chapters. This is chapter zero, which is still the first chapter. And it has, it's like broken into subsections. I bet they're like point of view changes. And then there's chapter one. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read all of chapter zero. I happen to see that chapter one is in, okay, chapter one is 1934, chapter zero is 1944. So. 10 years after chapter one. So there's gonna be some timeline planned, which you know, I'm actually a fan of, so that's cool. 
This is one of those times where I think I have to mention that I'm really bad at history and remembering dates. And so I'm not 100% certain exactly when World War II started, which is probably a problem. But also, I should be able to pick that up from context. This is a historical fiction novel. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm going to keep reading it. You know, it, it's obviously going to be kind of a hard read, but it's really well written. The first, the chapter zero actually starts out, it seems like the, based on the inside flap, the main characters are all in a city that's about to be bombed by American artillery or American bombers. One of the main characters is hiding and you don't know if she seems to be like a good guy and you don't know if she's gonna find shelter in time. And then the other one, is working for the Nazis, but he has found shelter. So yeah, based on the inside flap, it, it seems like he's going to realize how he messed up. So yeah, it seems like it's, you know, it's, it's a thick book. It's gonna be a literary read. This one's gonna be a slow read for me, but I do think it's going to be worth it. And like historically, I really do like historical fiction. Um, that is, a will read, which means that I have four. Oh, that's so cool. Means that I have four books that I'm going to read. So that's really cool. I, I think my internet should be back by now. I mean, hopefully. So that, that's gonna be it for right now. I'll either see you later today or tomorrow. Hi, it's been a long day of editing and filming and I almost forgot that I had to read at least one first chapter today. So I grabbed Island of the Ants. I'm not sure if I read this as a kid or if it was something that I've just like heard about. But yeah, I'm gonna read the first chapter right now and I'll let you know what I think. Okay, I'm pretty sure I didn't read this as a kid, but it's already really funny and the characters seem really cool. It reminds me of like Miss Piggle Wiggle a little bit, but instead of a bunch of short stories, it's going to be one arc. So yeah, I'm gonna put that in the to be read pile. I'm actually feeling kind of good. So this is next, Starcrossed. I bet it's like a fairy tale retelling, but I'm not sure. Oh, never mind. Maybe it's not a fairy tale retelling, it's just fantasy. Should be fun. I'll read the first chapter, we'll see. A basic summary of the first chapter of Starcrossed is that there's a young woman who's a thief and she is recovering in a safe house after a job that all of a sudden turned violent. She realizes that the authorities will be looking for her since her fellow thief killed someone and was killed himself. So she puts on a disguise to sneak away. And while she is trying to leave the area, she is stopped by a group of rich kids who invite her to hang out with them and presumably party and she accepts. Not bad. I actually, I was a little worried. I was thinking maybe I wouldn't put it in the to-be-read pile. I'm not really sure where I got it. Wouldn't be surprised, honestly, if I stole this from my sister's bookshelf during my parents' move. But, um, yeah, gonna read it. It's late. I'm tired. And I was about to go to bed. And then I realized I hadn't read today. So I was looking through my shelves for something that didn't feel intimidating. <laughs> The Complete Sherlock Holmes, Volume 1. This was a birthday gift. I feel like it was for my 21st birthday. I'm not sure. I think Sherlock Holmes stories are divided into chapters and I won't have to just read an entire story, but I guess we'll find out. So as someone who did watch the BBC Sherlock, obviously this first chapter is very familiar. It's when Sherlock and Watson meet. They're introduced by a mutual acquaintance. It's very interesting seeing things they kept and things they didn't. Honestly, okay, having just watched the Moriarty anime, Holmes being so excitable about finding this new test, it reminds me a lot more of the anime version, like, you know, excited and not in a mean way. So it actually makes me more excited to read this. So yeah, definitely keeping this. Gonna read some Sherlock Holmes and not the uh, written for kids summarized version that I've read in the past. In an effort to keep from doing what I've done the last two days, which is read a book like when it's nighttime, right before I go to bed, I'm going to read first thing in the morning. So good morning. I got bored watching YouTube. So I'm going to read instead, but only first chapters. I grabbed two books last night that I didn't read last night and said I read Sherlock Holmes, which is probably the correct decision. But first of all, this one's called The Black Company. I have no idea where I got it from, but it's on my bookshelf. So I'm going to read the back and then read the book and see what I think. This might not be fair, but I can't even finish the first chapter. 
it's an older book I think is part of it. It's written well honestly but in the first chapter they find out that like a local tavern has been poisoning their men and so they go in and like make a big fuss and so a lot of presumably innocent bystanders just get like killed. They talk about how like the country they live in like has a really bad justice system and I don't know I'm not about that right now. I don't think I'm gonna get rid of it right away because it is interesting Interesting. I think I'll put it I think I'm going to invent like a third category like not right now the category because I really do feel like I didn't even give it a fair chance because it was written well I'm not gonna deny it there are parts where I'm like ooh, this is very interesting and also it's like the morning and I'm tired so you know we'll, we'll see it'll, it'll be given a second chance there's a second chance pile for like a year from now this is A Deadly Education by Naomi Novik. If you recall, I think I talked about this on my YouTube channel. I read Spinning Silver, which is one of her other books, and I loved it. So when I heard about like a magic school book, I got very excited. There is an issue that I've heard of since I received this book as a gift, which is apparently it does have a kind of offensive portrayal of black hair. So I'm going to read the first chapter. I don't know if it'll appear there or not, but I'm going to give it a read. Hello, it's the next day. I did not end up reading the first chapter of Deadly Education yesterday, and I'm feeling really crummy today. But when I was younger, like that's why I read, like I was feeling bad and I needed an escape and I needed to put my brain somewhere else. There's really no better time to read than <laughs> right now. Of course, it's incredibly well written, like, and the world building is so good and she explains it so well, but not in like an annoying exposition-y way. It's like exactly what I want Tales of Mundane Magic to be, which is exactly how I felt about Spinning Silver. Naomi Novik is just like what I aspire to be. So it sucks that I know there's going to be something offensive in this, like that I want to keep reading it anyway. And like sometimes in general, I do think that you can read something and recognize that aspects of it are problematic and still be able to appreciate what's good about it. I don't know, it's a problem that everyone sort of has to decide what to do about for themselves. I'm not offering any advice. For me, I think I'm going to keep reading this until it comes to the point where I can't compartmentalize anything offensive in it. So yeah, for now, this is going in the to read pile. Okay, so I just realized I don't really have any obligations today and there's nothing new to watch on YouTube and Survivor airs tonight. So I grabbed all of the books that I hadn't read yet off of my like historical, historical fiction-esque shelf. We've got a bunch of Anne Rinaldi stuff. Anne of Avalonia, is this the first? Uh-oh. This is not the first Anne of Green Gables book, which makes sense. That's probably called Anne of Green Gables, but I'm gonna try reading the first chapter. If I like it, I'll just go find the other books in the series. Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, I've never actually read it. And this is called An Elegant Madness, High Society in Regency England by Venetia Murray. I think this is nonfiction actually. I don't normally like nonfiction, but maybe I will and I, I wanna check it out because I do like learning more about history, especially when I'm writing fantasy stuff. I guess I'll start with this because my hand is on it already. Yeah, I can't do it. I just don't like nonfiction. I, re I read a couple of pages and that's it. I read the preface. The preface was more interesting than the actual book. Oh, okay. I think I got this one at Goodwill at least, so it's not like it was a ton of money. Let's do Anne of, Anne of Av Avonlea. Anne of Avonlea. And if I like the first chapter, I'm probably not going to read the whole thing later, but I will keep it and then look into the rest of the series. You can tell it, this is in bad shape. I probably got it from a garage sale or something. Um, it's nice. Not, not good, not bad. I think probably it's more meant to like catch you up on everything after presumably some sort of time skip. I don't know how many books is in the Anne of Green Gables series. Oh, two. This is the second one. Oh, it's so hard to tell because the cover's broken. So yeah, so since the first book, this is the second book, I'm guessing they're catching up on the time skip. But it's interesting so far. And I do really like books that give a good snapshot of what life was like in a particular time. So I'm gonna keep it for now. <sighs> I'm a little nervous to read Frankenstein, but it's a classic. And I bought it because I, I want to have read it. Okay, I just read the like author's note. Yeah, the author's introduction in the beginning that talks about how Mary Shelley and her husband and Lord Byron decided to like all try to write ghost stories and that that's kind of what inspired Frankenstein. And it, it's interesting because I've read that story online before, but to hear it in her own words, or at least, you know, her own writing, oh, it just sounds really cool. Like she invented a genre. And it's really excited me to 
read the rest of the books. There is a preface, which was written by her husband, um, which, oh my God, there's annotations in here. <gasps> Oh, this is so exciting. Wow. Okay. The preface is long. Okay. But chapter one is short. Okay. I am so hyped now. The preface written by Mary Shelley's husband. It's a collection of letters from this Captain Walton who's on a North Pole expedition in a boat. And it's decently long and honestly was boring enough that I was like, oh my gosh, do I have to read this? And they pick up someone who was like slutting about on the North Pole, I guess. And they, you know, they like reanimate him as the annotator for this book noted is like an ironic thing because you know, Frankenstein animation and genuinely I was like is this guy Frankenstein or Frankenstein's monster and he was talked about so kindly and like Walton the guy who's writing these letters was talking about how you know he feels like a brotherly love for this man so I'm like oh also he was calling him creature constantly so I thought oh like this is Frankenstein's monster and he's chasing Frankenstein but then most of the book seems to be this man giving the account of his life and that's like what starts with chapter one so I think it's actually Victor Frankenstein, although he has not been named at all. Chapter one is about his parents, which is a weird little story. Don't want to get into it. And then his adoptive sister, who I believe he is in love with. I believe like romantically, creepily ownership of her. Anyway, um, it is written very interestingly. The annotations. <laughs> I love reading books that are pretty annotated. Definitely going in for the uh, religious imagery, trying to connect Adam and Eve and like father equals God a lot. Also just really hard anytime there's anything that can be connected to the idea of reanimation or bringing back to life, which there is a lot. I'm not saying the annotator's wrong, but they point it out. Of course, I can only imagine this was annotated by someone for an English class. So I thought I wasn't going to be excited to keep reading, but I am. So that's neat. Although I'm really glad the whole thing is not an epistolary novel because I already went through that with Dangerous Liaisons and I don't want to do that again. Next book, Revolutionary War book. It's called My Brother Sam is Dead. I bought this book because in fifth grade, I remember there was this like lesson plan where we were choosing a historical fiction book. I remember this being one of the books that we could choose. And for years and years and years, I thought this was the book that I did choose and that I remembered specific scenes from it. But like notably, it was from the point of view of a woman, a young woman. This is not, this is the point of view of a man. I found that out a couple of years ago and I was disappointed, but I decided, oh, well, I should read it anyway. And so knowing me again, found the study used bookstore or something and decided to grab it to see what I guess was the alternate reading that I could have done for that section. So let's see if it's worth pursuing. <laughs> this is the first one I tried to keep reading. I just, I love American Revolution fiction. It's just the fact that things were so heightened. It's just so, it's so melodramatic. That really is what it comes down to. So in this book, the father is a loyalist or at least just like a let's not have war. And Sam, the main character's older brother is, uh, you know, a revolutionary. He's like in the American army. And I mean, it's a fast read. It's probably for middle grade. I mean, like I said, I think the option I had to read it was in fifth grade. I could probably burn through this entire book right now, but that's not the point of what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm not sure what the point is, but it's not that, not right now. More historical fiction. This is by Anne Rinaldi. It's called Cast Two Shadows. Okay, it's another American Revolution. It's another split family. That's again, very common with this. Oh, fudge. So this is about some of the horrible stuff that plantation owners did. And it's going to be dealing with the morals of that, probably. And Rinaldi usually handles this stuff very well. And I think I read this one a long time ago. I have a lot of Anne Rinaldi books that I left on the shelf and didn't grab because I've read them too recently. And you know, I know I'm gonna keep them. They're like some of my favorites, like Finishing Becca and Girl in Blue, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to read this one. Then I'll be reading this one, A Break with Charity, also by Anne Rinaldi. This one's about the Salem Witch Trials, and I believe it's an epistolary novel because I kind of remember trying to read it. Oh, it's not. Then I have no idea. Maybe I just skipped it when I was in middle school because Salem Witch Trials was not American Revolution fiction. That's mostly what I had read from Anne Rinaldi at that point. Who knows? Anyway, I'm going to read both these books. I'm pretty sure I'm going to keep both of them, but still going to read them. So I just learned something that 
I should have known probably for a while. The Salem witch trials happened way before the American Revolution. As I've probably said in this video before already, I'm very bad at history. I'm very bad at knowing dates and things, but I do know that Hamilton, the musical, it starts in 1776 and that that's like about when the American Revolution happened. And this takes place in 1692. As always, I really love Anne Rinaldi's writing. I really love her characters. I love how her first chapters, usually there's like a preface and then a first chapter. And so her prefaces are always really good at just like setting the tone and understanding of the main character and like the world they live in. And then the first chapter starts to get into the main story. And it's just really good and I really like it. And I'm excited to see where these stories go. That's all the books that I grabbed from that shelf. I'm going to take a break right now. I'll probably just see you tomorrow. But what a good day of reading, honestly. That was exactly what I needed today. Hello, I am about to travel uh, by car to my sister-in-law's place for the weekend and I needed a lot of first chapters of books to read to continue this project. So I've packed a bag that's just entirely books. Some of them were getting into my more aesthetic books. I thought since I really like murder mysteries, I'd start with a murder mystery to ease myself into it. There are some books that I've had for a really, really long time and I've never read. It's going to be a good weekend. Not just because of this, because of other reasons too, but yeah. Good morning. I'm visiting my sister-in-law. Like I said yesterday, I didn't end up actually reading a book yesterday. So that's the first time that I failed. So I got to make up for it today, I guess. And we're going to go with Dressed to Kill. It's a book that I bought because it looked kind of aesthetic, but it is a murder mystery. It's from 1941, which is wild. It has like the cut pages and everything. Honestly, I hope I like it. I hope I want to keep reading it because that would be really fun. This is the biography of Martha Washington written in 1897. Like it's hard to explain the paper in this book feels different in different sections and the writing's actually pretty good like decently entertaining. I know that I said I don't like nonfiction but yeah I read most of the first chapter and I think I'm gonna keep reading but I have to go to lunch right now so yeah. Hey, it's been a bit of time. I read a lot of books while I was visiting my sister-in-law. I'll go through them all maybe tomorrow. But right now, after talking to one of my best friends, he reminded me that I haven't read Clariel yet. And Sabriel, the first book in this series, is the reason me and him were friends. So I thought, might as well read the first chapter of this book right now. The prologue of Clariel involves a poor fisherman who finds a bottle and wants to sell the stopper, which is made of some sort of valuable material. He opens it and releases some sort of evil creature. This is obvious to the audience, but not to him, which is part of what makes the writing so great. He seems to be possessed by the creature. Then we get the first chapter, which introduces Clariel, who's recently moved from the place she grew up to a big city, and her parents are metal workers in the fancy guild. And now she needs to be escorted around, and there are politics and nothing happens and I already don't like the main character. I hate when I don't like books by my favorite authors. It's really frustrating. I don't remember Garth Nix being this expository in other books, but it's been a little while. But that, that, okay, so the prologue was pretty interesting and then the first chapter dragged. So I'm keeping this one because I do kind of want to keep reading. I am curious. The prologue was pretty good. It's not the same. Like, I remember the first chapter of Sabrael, and that was much better. Okay, it's late and I'm tired, but uh, I have some friends coming to town that are staying with us, so need to be awake to see them. Let's choose a book. Let's see what Madame Bovary is about. Honestly, it's just such a pretty book. It might go in my display pile, but maybe I'll read it. Who knows? That was wild. I'm realizing I have no idea what this is about and I'm pretty sure I looked it up when I bought it but now I can't remember and the first chapter was such a whirlwind that I almost feel like I shouldn't look it up because then maybe I'll just stay surprised but yeah uh it's not just decoration I'm probably gonna read this at least one more chapter eventually. I'm not sure what day we're on anymore but I'm going to go through the books that I read and decided to keep and read and decided not to keep from my trip last weekend. And I am going to do really quick first chapter reviews for you. Secret Guard. The main character is spoiled and no one likes her but her parents die from cholera. Yikes! And she's nearly forgotten but is found. Keep. Martha Washington. The nonfiction biography of Martha Washington, the first first lady of the United States. Surprisingly. Keep. Dressed to kill. Again, surprisingly. 
Two advertising companies are at a skiing getaway with a large potential client. There's one woman on the trip whom the other guests wouldn't miss if she were to disappear. I sure hope she doesn't turn up dead. By the way, it's a murder mystery. Keeping it. I will fear no evil. The ailing in a hospital bed lead exec of a corporation one-ups a subordinate on his board of directors and then fires him. He then dismisses the meeting except for his lawyer and secretary and even has the nurse monitoring him turn off any recording devices. He has his secretary fill the newly empty board position and tells his lawyer he wants to acquire a brain-dead body for him to inhabit since he's old and dying. It was pretty fascinating. Keep. Mind Games by Kirsten White. A teen girl is sent to assassinate a teen boy, but he's nice to a dog and she realizes she can't do it. Another group of assassins comes for him and she defeats them using her superhuman ability to sense the right thing to do and her assassin training. Her and the boy run off. Keep. And also I've been thinking about this book since I read the first chapter, so excitedly keeping to read. Death on Tap, cozy mystery from Leavenworth that I got when we were visiting the town. A brewer discovers her husband is having an affair. Honestly, I can't remember what else happens in the first chapter, but it's well written enough that I don't care. It's a keep. It's funny already. Neuromancer, I think I'm going to put it in the to be given a second chance stack because I know it's a famous sci-fi novel. I just think maybe I'm not in the right place to read it right now, but I know it's a classic, so I want to read it eventually. Oliver Twist. Oh my god. <laughs> Trying to slog through the first sentence. It was awful. It's just one of those classic books that was like paid for by the word. It's a beautiful copy and it matches the copy of Murder on the Orient Express that I have, so I'm gonna keep it for the decorative pile. Becca Cooper. A prequel to Alana the Lion is told through journal entries that change points of view. Mrs. Cooper, a tertiary character from Alana the Lioness, tells her son George, a love interest from Alana the Lioness, who's starting to steal, that his ancestor was a cop. We then go back in time through journal entries. I feel so bad because I love Tamora Pierce and I've wanted to read this. I think I've had this book for 10 years, but I just can't do it. I, I'm going to see if a friend of mine wants it because I hate the idea of just giving it away forever, but... I just can't. So I decided to keep six, get rid of one, put one in the decorative only pile. That's pretty good for a weekend. I've kind of organized the books that I've read already or sorted already. So behind Artemis here, we have the first shelf of books that I'm keeping and going to read. That list extends over here and then up to here. These are all books that I've read already and want to keep. I probably want to reread Crime and Punishment. You come over here and you have books that have already been sorted for display or I have duplicate copies. The Secret Garden is in the TBR, but this is the other copy. These are all very pretty, very pretty. And I have read Murder on the Orient Express. Oh, and I've just moved this beautiful, this absolutely gorgeous copy of Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, love it. I pulled a bunch of decorative books that I'm going to read and sort from this shelf and then also this shelf. There used to be books here. These will be pulled eventually, except for Crime and Punishment. Ooh, I didn't know that I had another copy of this. Neat. You might be wondering, Shayna, why do you have multiple copies of Crime and Punishment? Well, this one looks cool. This one is the one that I read in high school that my parents had held on to in my childhood bookshelf for many, many years. And this is the one that I bought to reread before I got this for my parents. I wonder if this is annotated. Yes, it's annotated. Ah, oh, my favorite kind of read. Okay. So here are the books that I pulled from my bookshelf to make room to do all that sorting back onto my bookshelf. So I'm going to read them. And I'm going to start with the one that makes me the most scared. This is Curtain by Agatha Christie. It is Poirot's last mystery. And I know from reading spoilers somewhere else that Poirot dies at the end of it. But... I'm only reading the first chapter right now. I just get the fun beginning of reading an Agatha Christie murder history. Yes, okay. Okay, so I think it makes a bit more sense that this is Poirot's last mystery. He seems to be very old and frail. And like the whole first chapter is very much like, ah, oh, has it really been so long since I first met him? So the first book in the Poirot series is called Murder at the Styles or something like that. And I own that one, or at least I've read that one. I might have uh, got it out of the library, but I've read that one and they're actually going back to the same place. So that's pretty cool. It's a very like book ends. You know, if, if Poro is going to die, I'm 
a little bit grateful that it's like, oh, he's old and ailing and not a product of the time anymore. Like thematically, it works thematically. I'm a little less apprehensive about eventually reading this and that's nice. The wonderful thing about characters dying is with characters you can kind of bring them back to life by reading their same books again because you're having the exact same experience as you did before. I do that a lot with Tamara Pierce books. So yeah, definitely going to read this. So I haven't been very consistent about reading or filming when I have read, so let's go over the books that I have read and have decided to keep. This one is called Rosemary, A Christmas Story. I'm pretty sure I bought this just because it looked kind of cool and a little festive. And okay, it's an older book from 1906 and the pages are, they're so thick. All the text is like, there's such thick margins. And then the paper will be a little bit different when it's like an image page, like this one, like this page is really thin. And this is like cardstock. But anyway, this is about a man who has come to Monte Carlo for Christmas because he was infatuated with a woman who has since left his life and we do not know why. And then he meets or technically re-meets a young woman who he had met either a couple months or a year and a couple months prior because um, this is Christmas and he says they met in October. It's like the man has come into money recently and this, this young woman, not the young woman he was infatuated with, but this young woman is like down on her luck her mom's really sick so he like takes her out to lunch and that's the whole first chapter but there's just like something subtle about the narration where like i'm getting the vibe that the young woman is running a scam on the guy it's just it's just an inkling that i'm getting and it's a very old book so i feel like that would be pretty progressive maybe it's very interesting so i'm going to keep this one and read it this book is called Touched with Fire. It's pretty plain, which makes me think maybe it had a dust jacket originally. In the beginning, it has a map of the uh, United States because it is a book about some guy who wants a life of adventure and he wants to set sail from France. It's broken up into four books. The first one is called Madeline, which is not the name of any character that has appeared yet. And I don't believe it's the name of the ship that they're on. Fleur Dior. So definitely not the name of the ship. So I have no idea. It could be a love interest that appears. There are going to be a lot of women on the ship, which is super bad luck, of course. As someone who in general likes pirate stories, I don't know. I'm hoping it's sort of like an accurate account of sea life. That would be interesting for me to see. This is Heidi. I'm pretty sure I picked it up because this was another one of those books that is like a classic that will get summarized and then resold to children as like a summarized classic, kind of like Dracula or Frankenstein. That's why I read those books. And I saw it at a Goodwill and it was just, I don't know, it was cute. And it was like the cool cover. This one also has a really cute uh, pencil note. It says to Carol from Santa Claus 1959. And I just think that's really sweet. It doesn't actually have a like copyright publishing page, but it has, you know, some cute illustrations. I know nothing about this <laughs> Story. I know it's a classic, but so far in the first chapter, it is introducing the girl Heidi and sort of her backstory via her aunt. And her aunt is dropping her off with her grandfather, who is not the aunt's father. And I think that's the whole vibe of the story is like grouchy grandfather ends up falling for rambunctious young granddaughter. So, you know, it's cute, nothing offensive, nothing remarkable, but uh, I'm interested to see where it goes. So keeping it. The Shapeshifter's War. This is a self-published book that a friend of mine made. I don't know when I bought it or if she gave it to me. She is actually the editor and her and her friends each wrote a chapter, I think. The first chapter is pretty good. It's about some dragons talking about a war that's going on with the humans. And then we switch perspectives to the Empress or Queen, who I think it's mentioned as like a teenager. It's not quite clear what the war is about. It's interesting. I'm probably going to read it no matter what because it's a friend's book. And even if I wasn't going to read it, I think I would give it a special exception to have it on my bookshelves even if I'm not going to read it because, you know, it goes on the friends and family published books shelf. So I already mentioned that I had read the first chapter of Poro's last murder mystery and that it had a very sad beginning vibe. This one was so <laughs> fun, enthralling. I don't know. This is Miss Marple's last case. It's the other book that Agatha Christie published posthumously. I really hope I'm pronouncing that word right. I've never heard it 
out loud. I've only ever read it. It's probably not posthumously anyway. And this one opens up with a woman who like by all accounts has no knowledge of Miss Marple and she's newly married and she's going to buy a house. And it's pretty funny because she's getting a house tour from the owner of the house and the woman's talking about like, oh yes, I'm selling the house because my husband died and oh yeah, he got pneumonia. And the narration is like, with half of her mind, the woman was making all the appropriate like, oh, that's so sad noises. And the other half of her mind, she was like, ooh, I have to paint that. Ooh, my china cabinet can go there. And I just, I find that so funny. I ended up starting the second chapter without meaning to. So the Agatha Christie is a very entertaining writer and it was very nice. I read this one pretty quickly after I had read Curtains, The Last Poirot Mystery, and that one starts very doom and gloom. And this one, it was really nice. Even though it is the last Miss Marple book, it was nice that it was at least fun to read. Last up is Big Magic. I believe this was a gift. It is a advice book. It's a book about unlocking your creativity which is why I think it was a gift because I don't really buy a lot of nonfiction for myself. And it's written by the woman who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, which I didn't realize until I think it's like on the first page. It's like, oh, other works by this author. And I immediately felt a bit weird about it because... Okay, my explanation here is long. Basically, Eat, Pray, Love, the movie is based on a memoir by the author. And I found out that in real life, the author isn't as nice as the movie makes her seem. So reading an advice book from her felt strange but I read the first chapter anyway because I had to for this video and it's really well written, which shouldn't surprise me. So I'm going to keep reading it. Um, and if you're the person who bought it for me as a gift, I mean, thank you. And I'm sorry it's taken me this long to read it. And with that, I'm going to read another first chapter because the day is getting late and I want to get back on track. This is A Peculiar Treasure by Edna Ferber. Edna Ferber has written an autobiography. Oh, this is her autobiography. Autobiography? Pretend I said that right. Also written a bunch of short stories, including one called Buttered Side Down. <laughs> Novels and plays. That's cool. Copyright 1938 and 1939. Wow, this is already like fun to read. I'm going to like lean back and enjoy this book comfortably. <sighs> I just had a moment reading this book. Uh, so this is an autobiography. Auto, so this is an autobiography of a writer. When she was seventeen, she started working for the newspaper. So she was a journalist, and she's also written plays and books and stories. And she talks about how technology has changed so much just in her lifetime, and that it feels weird to think of people who were born after the World War of 1914 to 1918, which I believe is the First World War. But yeah, she's talking about how like, and she doesn't say it in like a dismissive way, she says it like in an amazed way, kind of, right? Where it's like, the youth of today take for granted airplanes, television, radio, streamliners. And I'm just like, you have no idea. And I'm like, oh my gosh, am I going to feel that way in 10 or 20 years about, I mean, I do kind of feel that way already about people who never had a flip phone, who've only ever known smartphones. Like I remember when computers were these huge, bulky things and laptops were like this wild concept when they were first created. I used tapes, but I, I've always remembered CDs, but I remember feeling very clever when I knew that the like new video technology of the day was DVDs when a teacher asked it in class. I am genuinely fascinated to read this book. The author talks about wanting to record America as it was today and like what she's learned from being a reporter and like living life and what it's like being her. I could keep reading. I could keep reading to try to find the end of the chapter. And honestly, I, I, I kind of want to just stop here and say, yes, I'm definitely going to read this book because honestly, I just want to keep it a surprise for now and have less to reread, I guess, later and more to just read. I just think this is so exciting because these types of books you don't know about, you know? I don't know what a contemporary book for this is. I mean, it's an autobiography. Like, those aren't famous. So I'm not going to look up this author yet as much as I want to. I'm not going to. I'm going to read this and then I'm going to do that to see how much is known about her. But yeah, how fascinating. This is a collection of novels by Dashiell Hammett. And the list is The Red Harvest, The Dane Cruise, The Maltese Falcon, The Glass Key, and The Thin Man. I probably grabbed this one because I recognize the name The Maltese Falcon. I actually don't know anything about it. Um, but there's this television show called Leverage and The Maltese Falcon as a title is 
sort of like a gotcha moment in the last episode of either season two or season three and I want to know what that's about and also there's a middle grade book series that I really liked when I was a kid and I believe the first book but it might not have been the first one it might have been the second one. there was a book called The Malted Falcon and it was a candy bar and I believe it was a parody of the Maltese Falcon. Now I'm wondering if that is at all like an accurate parody then I might be able to solve this mystery first. But anyway, I'm going to flip to the Maltese Falcon and read its first chapter. And if I really like the writing style, maybe I'll read the rest of this book. Samuel Spade? I know that name. Do I? I probably know parodies. Do I know Sam Spud? It's from the kids show Between the Lions. There is a parboiled, <laughs> the parboiled potato detective Sam Spud. Oh my god, there's a picture. I'll put it up. I think my point is that I've absorbed this character through cultural osmosis. Let's begin. <laughs> what a great first sentence. Samuel Spade's jaw was long and bony, his chin a jutting V under the more flexible V of his mouth. His nostrils curved back to make another smaller V. His yellow-gray eyes were horizontal. The V motif was picked up again by thickish brows rising outward from twin creases above a hooked nose, and his pale brown hair grew down from high flat temples in a point on his forehead. He looked rather pleasantly like a blonde Satan. Okay, okay, I'm just gonna read. This must be what every film noir parody is parodying. Like, it literally ends with him rolling and lighting a cigarette the first chapter. This is gonna be fun. Hey, oh no. We've got Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. So I've never read Little Women. I've also never seen any of the movies. And that is because I've seen the musical. Spoiler alert for a very old book. 1868. Okay, I feel fine spoiling this. One of the sisters dies, like the one you like the most. And in the musical, there's this very sad song. Before she dies, she's like very sick or something. And she sings to Joe this song, something, Some Things Are Meant To Be. And it makes me cry every time. I'm very close to my younger sister. I love her very, very much. And just thinking about a younger sister dying is not good for me. So I've never read it, but I do have a couple of copies because they're usually very pretty. Here I go. Okay, that was cute. It's very interesting because the musical starts when the girls are older and it does like flashbacks and I know that the newest movie does that as well. And I can understand how that might add some needed context, you know, so you know where the girls are going to end up and you get to enjoy watching them go there as opposed to starting in the very beginning. But yeah, it's it's fine. It's good. It's cute. No one is the clear main character yet, which is kind of interesting because I thought that Joe was the main character. Yeah, anyway, it's good. It is now getting truly dark outside, so I will see you next time. Okay, so here we've got some classics, Swiss Family Robinson, Treasure Island, Scarlet Pimpernel. This is the Moonstone. I believe it's one of the first mysteries, or at least an old mystery, so that's why I bought this, and I'm, I'll probably I'll probably start with this one. Very interesting book so far. The preface is about someone stealing the moonstone from a royal treasury in India. And then we sort of skip to after it's been stolen from the British house that it's been in. It's told from different narrators through that sort of thing. I don't know, I already think it's fun. I already wanna know what happened. So yeah, I'll hold on to it, why not? So I'm back on the floor. I started this video on the floor because I wanted you to see the scale of the problem that I was dealing with when I said that I had too many books that I hadn't read, or at least that I felt like I had too many books that I haven't read. And this, this is not even all of my books, okay? I have another shelf there and another shelf there. But yeah, um, now I am on the floor because I have failed. I did not finish my challenge. I, I maybe got halfway through reading the first chapter of every single book that I own because there's just so many and 
I think it was an unfair challenge to give myself anyway because first chapters they're meant to do all the things that I said. They're meant to establish tone and writing style and what the book is about and characters and all that stuff but also notably first chapters are supposed to be first. They're supposed to lead into the second chapters and you know if you're not doing that it causes some mental anguish. I, I know that I mentioned that I have been thinking about books that I read the first chapter of and then didn't get to finish. The two big ones are Deadly Education and The Rook. They're just really well written first chapters, really interesting mysteries or worlds set up in the very beginning and I want to finish them. But I've had this video going on, I've had this challenge that I've given myself and so I felt like I couldn't just stop that to just read the books and so I've been kind of paralyzed with indecision and that hasn't been good. And then for the last couple of weeks I have not read anything because I wasn't interested in first chapters and also I was kind of tired from all of the first chapter reading that I did in a row. I mean I, I read a lot right? Like I mean I, I think I read a lot. I I don't actually know the exact count but if I know my editing self I'll have I will have kept a count so that's the number of books that I ended up reading the first chapter of. And also I have to include one more. Yep, I read a Goosebumps book, first chapter. And this is the last first chapter that I read as part of this challenge because I just, I couldn't do it anymore. So yeah, I failed. But you know, it's okay because like I said, I'm really looking forward to reading some of these books. And if I give up on this challenge, then I have a really good reason to, you know, go and read other books. So I'm gonna do that. So yeah, that's the end of the video and the challenge, but it's not the end of me reading. I don't know if anything on earth could stop me from reading, if I'm being honest. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you thought that my summaries of the books and my little vlogs were interesting. If you want to know the books that I read, if you want to buy them yourself, I will link them all below, probably on Bookshop, because uh, if you buy books on Bookshop, then that supports independent bookstores. And a lot of them might be out of print, but I will do my best. Maybe I'll find them on Abe Books or something if you're interested. I'll also link my story graph down below because that's where I'll be writing reviews for these books and if you are interested in what I thought of them after I read the whole thing, you know, I think I should include that for you. Thank you so much for watching! If you liked the video, if you want to see more reading content, please give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment with your favorite or most interesting book that I read. If you want to yell at me for any of the books that I decided to give away or if you want to call dibs on any of them, you know, comment below. And yeah, Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Cheers!